Hi guys, Abdullah Molim here, and welcome to this special episode of Yesterday's Capers. On behalf of the Yesterday's Capers gang, we want to wish Sesame Street a big happy birthday and congratulations for being on the air for 50 years. 50 years! How awesome is that? To celebrate this truly remarkable milestone, you can now listen to producer Paul and myself talk all about Sesame Street. And if you missed it the first time around, that's okay, because you can listen to it right now. Enjoy! And let's go back all the way to November of 1969. So this was the month and year where two million people took part in the Vietnam War Moratorium demonstration across the United States. And keeping in theme with that, John Lennon decided to return his OBE in protest of UK support of the Vietnam War. And also this was when Brazilian soccer legend or football legend, soccer for the American listeners, Pele scored his 1,000th, 1,000th professional goal. I can't even say 1,000. 1,000th professional goal. You like Pele, Paul? Um, I had a picture of Pele on my wall once, but it was only because he was with Michael Schumacher. <laughs> and also, how do you return an OBE? Because presumably there's a big ceremony, Queen and this and that and the other, you get knighted and it's all great. But how, do you, how do you give it back? Do you say... It's John Lennon, isn't it? He just do you rock up to the palace? Hey, listen. I don't I need, want it no more. And, you know, and he's, I, need uh, to, I need to see the Queen. Uh, you, can have, you can have this. I don't want it. Or do you think he just sent it in the post? I don't know, probably. I bet he didn't send it, really. Or maybe he's like, I'm sending this back. Pocket, that'll be on Antiques Roadshow in a few years. He probably got Yoko to do it then. And also, what was number one in the charts was Fifth Dimension with Wedding Day Blues, as you can probably hear over us talking. Ah, oh, it's a great song, that is. Now, there's probably so much what we could say about this TV show, even us being Brits. In November 1969, Joan Gantz Cooney and Lloyd Morissette came up with an educational children's program that combined live action, sketch comedy, animation and puppetry. And obviously the theme song, Can You Tell Me How To Get To Sesame Street? It's probably one of the most classic, most famous, most well-known theme song of any children's TV program. And the format of Sesame Street is just basically their kind of way of explaining things in an educational way that kind of reflects American culture, viewing habits. So Sesame Street over the years always did well to kind of keep up with the times, always try to keep up with what's happening in society. They were always sort of ahead of the curve with certain things. They had a very diverse and, and multi multicultural cast. So, like, um, the first character you see in Sesame Street is a black guy, Gordon, Gordon Robinson. First ever. So, like, he's sort of coming in to Sesame Street and he's walking along with um, a girl and he's just basically showing her around, saying, you know, this is Sesame Street. These are some of the characters. These are all the nice things that happen on Sesame Street. Is this, very... is this in the theme tune? Hmm? Is this in the theme, in the theme intro? Yeah, it's almost, yeah. And this is like he's sort of walking along Sesame Street. He's a, a teacher. So Gordon, yeah, Gordon is a teacher and he's coming into Sesame Street after a long days of work and he's bringing a, a girl. I can't remember her name. It might be Susie or something. But yeah, he's just sort of Changes showing. every day. <laughs> well, I was going to call her Polly, but then that's a completely... Uh, a different show later yeah. on. <laughs> But yeah, he's showing her around Sesame Street. She's learning about certain things. And so she's, you know, drinking a glass of milk and she's learning the, the values of, of, of having a, a glass of milk. And also one of the things about Sesame Street was that every week or every episode, it would always be brought to you by a letter or, or a number. Or in this case... The very first episode was brought to you by the letters W, S and E and numbers two and three. So always what they'll kind of do is with the letter W, they'll try and come up with a story just to emphasize that letter. So there was a, a wicked witch who lived in the west of Wessex and 
she wandered around with a wand of hers and she would yeah so it was just carrying on with uh, the letter that's pretty w, good i wondered when you're gonna or the letter or the letter s slippery snake slides solemnly surreptitiously goes on and on so it's it's really cool so it's it's educational you're you're learning and you're trying to think oh these kind of go with with each letters and but yeah and so this was like a north and and as well the uh the author malcolm gladwell one of the things he said about sesame street was that sesame street was built around a single breakthrough insight that he, that if you can hold the attention of children you can educate them which they did pretty well to do because every episode was like an hour. Really? And even as watching, yeah, I'm, I'm watching it back and I'm like, I don't remember Sesame Street being an hour long. I used to remember, I think it's about a half an hour, 45 minutes. I don't remember. I have to say, I don't know a lot about Sesame Street. I never really watched it as a kid, but I don't think it'd be an hour. I don't think any kid could sit still for an hour and well, learn at the same time. Well, that's the thing. I think Sesame Street found the formula. Which is why, to this day, they're still running and they're still going strong. Maybe not in in the sense of uh, an international kind of way, but in America, it's still on PBS. It's still very much a thing. It's still very much... Elmo is very much a thing. Big Bird is very much still a thing. Cookie Monster. And then you got Count Count Von Count. Ah, 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 ah. That was when that was when you were supposed to do the effects, Paul. Okay, okay try again. Come on. Ah, 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 ah. Thank you. Got there in the end. Sorry. Sorry yeah, this that. is yeah. This is why. It's my one job, and I. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some uh, interesting statistics about Sesame Street. A 1996 survey found that 95% of all American preschoolers had watched the show by the time they were three years old. Also, it was estimated that 86 million Americans had watched the series as children. That's more than and... the population in the UK. <laughs> and also, Sesame Street over the years had won 189 Emmy Awards and 11 Grammys, which is more than any other children's show. 111 Emmys? 189. 189. Does it get to a point when you're at the award ceremony and you already start walking up? It's like... It's before like, they've even called your name it's out. It's like Anton Deck And the winner here, is and you're already up. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like Anton Deck here. <laughs> it's like, oh, what's the point of <laughs> being up for like, you know, we just light give you entertainment show? Ant and Deck are always going to win, <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's just no point. So I think, but then, you know, if you're going on for like 40, 50 years, you better be winning all of those Emmys and award shows. Yeah, it'd be better than winning none. I think... I w I would, I'd like to know who was up quite a lot against Sesame Street and always lost. Because that's like 189... That's a good question. That's 189 losers against Sesame Street as well. Well, more than that. Because it would have been like four in the final, right? I don't know how the Emmys work. I mean, I would, yeah, I mean, oh, presumably is... there's four finalists, right? <laughs> so that's like three for 189. I don't know. It's just the Emmys, just, I don't know, just get everything and just put them all and just pick a winner at the hat. Well, be... Gobbledygook Castle was great, but as, a, as an English one, I think, wasn't it? Do you remember yeah. that? For the up and down and round and flick. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I don't, magic I, don't, pen. I don't think that's going to win. <laughs> Wait, I learned to let. Uh... Learned to write in that, from that show. Oh, you mean words and pictures? Is that what it was called? And it had Gobbledygook Castle and it had the magic pen. You mean Alphabet Castle? Oh, is that what it's called? Alphabet Castle? Yes, I know Alphabet Castle. What's the I know Alphabet Castle I don't get very that from... well. Maybe he's one of the characters. Oh, maybe. But yeah, words and pictures. Yeah. And you'd have, you know, the F going round, down. And flick. F, yeah, and flick, yeah. yeah <laughs> Every see? time there's a flick. Yeah. I never flicked a letter in my life. There you go, yeah. So, um, yeah, these are all the shows that didn't win an Emmy because Sesame Street did. But, um, yeah, they won all of those all of those Emmys and pretty much became a, an American institution. And, I mean, I probably should ask you, but 
What about Barney the Dinosaur? When was that up? That's probably 90s, wasn't it? Was it that late? Oh, dude, I'm Barney the Dinosaur! I was just thinking... He's like, not going to win any Emmys against Sesame Street. No chance. I don't remember it. I, I don't guess. think Barney was educational, was he? Actually, yeah, it was. Surely he was. Yeah. I mean... It was a bit educational, but... Not in terms of Sesame Street. I don't remember the content very well. I just remember him jumping around with kids and stuff. I want you, you want me, we're a big old family. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Barney, but that's a... Yeah, like I don't think anything will touch Sesame Street in terms of putting it up against yeah. something. I think Sesame Street was like the standard bearer of educational shows. And as I was saying before, like they would... They would go deep into certain subjects. They would teach kids. They would inform kids. They would do all of the things. And they would do it in the way that the kids would be engaged. Because initially when they did these kind of tests and experiments, obviously, you know, at the time, I don't think there was many sort of glove puppets or Muppets or whatever Jim Henson was uh, creating. So... They thought, oh, let's just try and have these um, sort of Muppet things on. And it showed that the kids were more inclined or more likely to engage with a program with all of the all of the Muppets. Mm. So they just thought, we'll include the Muppets. We'll include a bit of music. We'll include a bit of teaching. So they'll have whatever word it is. So if it's brought to you by the letter B, they'll probably talk about a bouncing ball. They'll probably talk about beach balls and playing ball <laughs> on the beach and whatever, whatever goes with the letter B. <laughs> but yeah, that's but yeah. I, that's that was what was really really kind of good about Sesame Street. I thought. Yeah, as I said, I didn't really watch it, but even though I didn't watch it, I know so many characters that were. Thing, obviously, uh, so many more adult cartoons, Family Guy and. American Dad and things like that, and they they parody it all all the all the time. Yeah, I think Scrubs as well did uh, an episode about uh, Sesame Street called My ABC. So it's uh, what series kind of, was that a, la- a latter series? Yeah, it was like I think series eight. So it's just they'll have like the characters of Sesame Street, and they'll kind of teach the sort of doctors about you know life and death and how you should um, always care for the patients. You should even know that you know they're at their last days. And you had, I think, Joshua Radin, who's one of the singers. He kind of did his version of "Can You Tell Me How to Get to Sesame Street." And I think one of the one of the one of the funny things I think I was telling you before we started about Sesame Street was um, they were doing um, a thing about um, milk. As I was saying, they were oh, you know, yeah. talking about how milk was really good for you, and milk is really uh, a healthy choice of living and. You know, they did this really, really cute video and song about um, a cow and how the cow comes, you know, you you can sort of get milk from the cow. And it was quite, and they were showing how, you know, you milk the cow and and all that stuff. And it sounded like a really nice, lovely folk kind of song that you would think that uh, Cat Stevens or James Taylor was singing. It's like, you know, hey cow, you're very cute. You milk and na, na, na. and it's just one of those like really lovely bit of uh, guitar on the go. And... Yeah, it, it was it was very guitar-y based, and like I said, I, you would be forgiven if you thought that it was a a James Taylor or a Cat Stevens or both enough. great both great singers as well. Yeah, both great singers, and if if it was any of them that did it, then hats off. Yeah, kudos, kudos. You know, shout out to Yusuf Cat Stevens now. And uh, to James Taylor, I'm I'm still I'm sure that they're still singing, but yeah, they were doing that song, and I was thinking, fifty years ago, milk had a tremendous reputation. Oh, milk is good for you. It's got calcium and it helps you grow your bones. Nowadays, it's like yeah, but nowadays, I agree. You couldn't do that song about milk and how amazing milk is. But that's I reckon a lot of that's because there's too many milks to choose from now. You got oat milk and almond milk and yeah. I tried coconut milk the other day. Any good? Yes, surprisingly, oh, I I am amazed at how much I liked it. 
I, I, want, I specifically asked for cow's milk. It's got to be straight out of a cow. Dairy free, mate. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going that way now. Are dairy you, free. I think I've was sold because I'm thinking, oh, I'm just adding it to stuff, and mm. I just thought, you know what? Let me just have a, a little taste. And I do not like coconut, but you with this coconut. Did you have any coffee, or did you just have it on it? I had it in a shake, so like a sort of a protein kind of shake thing. Yeah. So adding the dairy free coconut milk, and it was great it's great with the shake and it's great on its own so i was mm. thinking I'm, like, I'm yet to be sold on it i mean but, <laughs> but it's like yeah you they couldn't get away with doing a a segment about milk and cows no, today definitely not no no way but then knowing sesame street and how ahead of the curve they are they'll probably do a thing about vegan and yeah the value of vegan life and how dairy is not necessarily the way to go. That's a... I think, I think you're right. I mean, they would probably tackle something like that. Um, it's, such a, <laughs> it's such a growing thing, isn't it? Veganism, isn't it? It is. It feels like everything's going that way. It's like, it makes it more difficult to sit and eat your, drink your milk. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's not, it's not cow's milk. It's not from a cow. No, yeah, you you wouldn't be having Gordon telling you how good for you the normal kind of milk is, and you wouldn't have any of that. So, and obviously, uh, the show's like sort of success kind of led throughout the eighties and even through the nineties, where I kind of think that was kind of the uh, the golden era of like Sesame Street, internationally speaking. I would say the sort of the late eighties and into the early nineties. And as I was saying before, like one of the really notable episodes or really one of the notable moments was uh, Mr. Hooper, who kind of sort of ran the the grocers. He in real life. So Will Lee, the actor, he passed away in 1982. And so they kind of did um, a tribute to Mr. Hooper and. Big Bird, I think it was, kind of sort of telling one of the characters about death and, you know, they're paying tribute to Mr. Hooper, talking about, you know, these are some of the things that happens in life and we should try and remember them and remember all the good that they did. And it's it's very, um, it was very, very lovely. Yeah, looking, looking up, so as I said, I don't know too much about it. I learned a lot about this just before we uh, started recording, but it says, um, it says he died of a heart attack as well. So it would have been very sudden for the crew and for the yeah. cast and for the writers, directors and everything. Yeah, yeah. So they would have been dealing with it just as much as the characters were. And then in turn, the audience, mm. audience as well. So everyone's all like grieving together. Exactly. And it's, it must be quite a, a helpful part of the healing process to... You know, to to everyone, imagine the whole of America, the whole of the world saying yeah. saying goodbye at the same time, and you're helping to to do it justice. And obviously, you haven't. It's not like someone's left the show. I don't know if he did leave the show before, or maybe, but it, I don't think he, he did because he was a um, sort of mainstay. So he was on the very first episode and continued on exactly. So, until... he's, so he's not filmed his final episode. He's not filmed uh, an no. ending for himself. He's literally. Well, yeah, the, right. The writers, directors have have nothing to go on. They have to to deal with this as a you know the show must go on kind of uh, yeah. aspect of yeah. of, yeah. of, of, te- of television. Yeah, and so I think um, one of the thing about Sesame Street was sort of the the nineties. You kind of saw uh, obviously you got the new societal and sort of economic challenges, and obviously the viewing habits of children change. So that's where kind of Sesame Street kind of saw a little bit of a decline in terms of ratings, in terms of popularity. It wasn't really hitting the the highs that they they had during the sort of the eighties and the uh, the sort of early nineties. And they thought, you know what, we need to switch it up and they started to make it more narrative and ongoing storylines. Cause I thought this is gonna be the only way that we keep fresh and we sort of maintain maintain the audience. So I think that was... Like a soap opera sort of. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. So obviously before it was just kind of like, oh, we'll just do like sketches and segments and yep. cute little things with numbers and, and all of that. But um, in terms of um, 2002 and 
the 2000s, the the producers thought the best way to move it forward, the best way to sort of keep in trend with what's happening is to kind of make it a more narrative based, more ongoing storyline kind of thing. So I wonder how much of the decline of the viewers, because you said before about them having a, you know, long shows, the kids attention was for like an hour. And then after, you know, kind of early nineties, late nineties and well, from, from the, I guess from the early nineties and onwards and it, it, kind of bigger was the the computers video games and yeah things like that so i wonder how much of that had an impact on one just outright the viewers because they want to play video games rather than watch tv and two the attention span of the kids because you try and get a kid nowadays to watch an hour's tv show it would be on his phone yeah so do you know what i mean obviously the video games can hold the attention more than i think the tv so i just wonder how that would have yeah i mean because you've got all of those things to compete with now Exactly, and it only got bigger, right? Isn't yeah, it? yeah, because you've got the internet, you got... Yeah, so you had video games, then the PC came out. Uh, what was that? You know, it kind of got more uh, commercial. Right. Then you had um, the the internet, mm-hmm. and then sometime in 2000s, the iPhone came out, and that was game over after that, I think. Yeah, but I think in terms of that, they've kind of found their way back again and they're like i said they're still going strong they're still producing programming they're still doing their thing the characters are still there they haven't necessarily thought you know what we're going to stop and even um with some of the characters i think as we were talking about some of the characters like kermit oscar the grouch the cookie monster bert and ernie big bird Elmo, who made his debut in uh, 1972. Obviously, uh, the two-headed monster, Mr. Snuffleupagus. You know, these are like iconic characters. And they're like, obviously, I think Elmo had his own spin-off show. Bert and Ernie had their own with uh, Bert and Ernie's Great Adventures. Elmo the Musical. So they always kind of found ways to freshen it up. And they always found ways to try and stay relevant yeah that's a good way yeah stay relevant i think that was what they always tried to do and uh, upon its 40th anniversary in 2009 sesame street received a lifetime emmy at the daytime emmy award so that was a really uh really a good thing and uh in terms of the uk in our country i mean it was uh at the beginning it was a very tough sell because I think Sesame Street wanted to kind of say, you know, look, we've got this really, really cool program. It's informative. It's educational. It's fun. And we want to sh- share it with the rest of the world. And right out the gate, the BBC were like, nope, not for me. Like they were like, we just don't like this. And, Monica Sims, who's the who was the head of the children's programming at the time, she was like, this sounds like indoctrination and a dangerous extension of the use of television. And apparently a teacher in North London had showed it to 400 educa- educators and most of the feedback was negative. But I think the, the kind of thing was that they said that it was brash and vulgar. But I think some people actually really liked it. So like parents and kids... When they were short showing it, they really, really liked it. But, um, and obviously I think the BBC as well thought that Sesame Street was carefully geared to the needs of disadvantaged children in America. And obviously the terminology, the BBC thought, why the hell are British kids going to know what trash means or zip code or sidewalk? They're, they're not going to know any of those things. So the BBC were thinking it's really daft for us to to go out of our way to show this. And they were just like listing all the ways that they don't want to do this. And, and also as well, the BBC were like, well, we got Blue Peter. It's just like Sesame Street, but in our opinion, it's better. Because obviously Sesame Street was saying, oh, we do this. It's informative, educational. Well, and the BBC at the time were like, well, that's our remit. 
to inform, to educate, to entertain. We've got all of that covered with Blue Peter. 189 Emmys. Uh, Mr. Mr. Trick, I think, right? I think so. Uh, but I think, yeah, at the time, I think BBC were like, we'll take our chances with what we've got and what we show. So they were, they were like, yeah, we, 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 got, we got our shows. We, we, we've got a remit. Like, we're we good. I think that was the, for want of a better expression, BBC were like to Sesame Street, we good. So, so who picked it up? Um, so ITV were also sold it. And again, they were reluctant as well. Apparently it was, at the time, I think it was government policy where they really needed to show, like, I think at the time the government were like, you need to be showing children's programming for a certain amount of time after school, you got to do it. So I think at the kind of the time, ITV said, you know what? Okay, sod it. We'll show it. We'll we'll take Sesame Street. We'll show it. And hopefully that will... Uh, Appease the, yeah. the authorities. Yep. And that, you know, we're, we're, we're showing children's entertainment programming and things like that. And so by the time Channel 4 came to our screens in 1982, I believe... They took Sesame Street and they showed it until 2001. So that was, that was how, as kids, we were watching Sesame Street. I'm trying to remember what times they used to show it because I, most of the time I remember watching Sesame Street was during the summer holidays. And during the summer holidays, they would show Sesame Street at around 12 o'clock. Midday. Every day, 12 o'clock, weekday will be Sesame Street. I, I'm sure I remember seeing it on the TV uh, in the mornings. Um, I'm sure it was like bananas in pajamas and Sesame Street yeah. and stuff all together. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure it was an early one for, for for me as a kid. I don't remember yeah too much about when it was on, but I'm sure it's because I rem I also remember in the evenings they used to show Sesame Street sometimes. So I think in the summer holidays they would show it midday. Yeah. Either 11 o'clock or midday would always be Sesame Street. But it'd be a good one because the, the nurseries often kick out at um, midday, yeah. right? So yeah, maybe yeah. it was even in the yeah. school. Because I remember the in, in, the, in the summer holidays on Channel 4, they used to show Sesame Street. And right after Sesame Street, they would show Madeline. What's that? I'm Madeline, I'm Madeline, the little French girl. I have no idea what that is. Madeline, you don't know what Madeline is? No, I'll, I'll look it up now. Yeah, it's the, the girls, they'd, they'd walk in straight lines. It's set in France. Madeline, was it t TV show? Yeah. TV, no, Madeline TV but She's show. like a little girl. Oh, oh, I do know it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... I thought... Uh, yeah. They would show that after Sesame Street. And I just remember, like, the end credits of Sesame Street in the 90s was so long. The end credits of, of Sesame Street? The end credits of Sesame Street, yeah. It would just be an absolute party <laughs> it would just be really 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 long it was like a, a sort of an extension of a can you tell me how to get to sesame street there would just be like a like a, just a party just the, the whole like end credit it was just like at least about three four minutes long and that's obviously really? yeah it's is that just because so many is that, is that because so many people worked on it they had to fill it probably or is it like a student's credits where so it's for all example, the same there'll person. be like a bird sort of flying somewhere. There'll be like a place where kids are dancing. There'd then be a place where, I don't know, they'd go around uh, Sesame Street, maybe. But yeah, I just that's just the thing about Sesame Street in the 90s that I remember as a kid growing up. And also, one of the songs I remember was Hip to Be Square by Huey Lewis in the news. And what they did, Sesame Street's their version called Hip to Be A Square. So, you know, you've got like a, a square looking character singing, you know, oh, I got four sides. It's hip <laughs> to be a square. I just remember that. That's a, oh, I love that. That's a, that was the thing that I remember. So much so that, obviously, I, as a kid, I'm like, who the hell are you? Actually, I didn't know who Huey Lewis in the news was, but you like, you didn't realize that that is their song. Yeah. But because Sesame Street would kind of take pop songs and they would kind of make it into their own and they would kind of, turn it into uh, an educational an educational thing that was so they jumped on the bandwagon of kind of popular culture pretty much uh, which presumably helped pretty them. much yeah so and you would always have celebrities coming along 
making appearances. Yeah, and they would, you know, do their kind of songs as well. So I think uh, with uh, Jason Mraz, he had a song called I'm Yours. Yeah. And they did yep. a version called Let's Go Outside. So let's go outside. I was going to say I'm yours. Yeah, let's go so outside. it's like <laughs> Elmo and Jason Mraz going, you know, I can't stand being inside, inside. So let's go outside. So yeah, it's so. a TV show inside, which likes viewers, encouraging kids to go outside. You love go, to see it. Go outside, but not for too long, because uh, we've got another episode in. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, that so that so in terms of that, they would always kind of use the whatever the the, the pop culture references, whatever is hot or whatever's popular. Yeah. They would just kind of use that and just kind of kind of go onto that. That's quite a um, an interesting and, and an impressive thing to do because if you imagine that most t- TV and stuff is recorded ages in advance. Yeah. You have to have your finger on the pulse. Pretty much. Or be really quick at making your TV shows. But I think with Sesame Street, they kind of had a, not a crack team, but like a, a really like strong selection of producers and, and, and people who work on the show and they would be really, really dedicated and then they would go out of their way to make the very, very best show that they can make. Yeah. And always, more often than not, they would always hit a home run they would always make it the best kind of the best kind of show that they can make it so that was um the really really cool thing about about sesame street any any last thoughts on sesame street no i mean all i can say is again i think i said it twice now already but um i've not really sat down and watched a single episode start to finish Mm. and even i know the characters and the music and yeah and, and things like that so i think Something that I have never seen and I'm still aware of. You know that they're 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 quite good at getting uh, their presence out there. Yeah, definitely. And to this day, and they'll be celebrating their fiftieth birthday in uh, November. So they've produced over four thousand five hundred episodes, thirty five TV specials, two hundred home videos, and a hundred and eighty albums. So, and they're still going strong. So, did you like that? Yeah, I thought you would. And there's plenty more where they came from. Yes, that's right. Full episodes of Yesterday's Capers are available right now. And you can find them wherever you get your podcast from. So, give it a listen. And while you're at it, if you love your boxing, why not check out Total Boxing Content? Also available wherever you get your podcast from. As for me... Join producer Paul and I next week for another brand new episode of Yesterday's Capers.